Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 78th New Social Environment. I'm Nick Bennett, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation with Odili Donald Odita and Rail Editor at Large Tom McGlynn. We're also thrilled to have the poet Mary Riley here, who will close today's program with a poetry reading. And now to introduce today's host. Tom McGlynn is an artist, writer, and independent curator based in the New York City area. His work is represented in the permanent collections of the Whitney Museum, the Museum of Modern Art, and the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum of the Smithsonian, among other national and international institutions. He's been a contributing writer to the Brooklyn Rail since 2012, where he is currently an editor at large. His most recent show of paintings, At Present, originally scheduled to run until late April 2020, will be reopened in September at Rick Wester Fine Arts in New York City. And Odili Donald Odita is an abstract painter whose work explores color both in the figurative historical context and in the socio-political sense. He is best known for his large-scale canvases with kaleidoscopic patterns and vibrant hues, which he uses to reflect the human condition. Uh, to keep it brief and to pass it over to you, Tom, um, thank you, Odili, thank you for being here today. Thank I'll you. Uh, hand this over to you and yeah, happy Friday, everyone. Uh, thank you, Nick, for the, the introductions. Uh, really great to see you, Odili, and thanks for everybody for joining us here today. I've, um, you know, I've, I've seen your work for a long time and I've, I've having this opportunity to really parse and go into it deeply is really a pleasure. Um, as you know, I'm an abstract painter too. Yes. Um, and you know, that whole question of uh, formalism and, and an abstraction, and I, I know that you say somewhere that people, uh, forgive me if I'm paraphrasing, but it's like people don't like or understand abstraction on some level. So I thought it might be interesting to talk about some of the symbolic elements in your work, um, n not to, uh, not to overprivilege those, but uh, just to kind of enter into this discussion of abstraction um, and how we derive meaning. Uh, could, because, just because the term is often kind of, um, it's, sometimes it's pejorative, you know. Um, abstraction or? or... Well, the term abstraction in, 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 in painting and maybe abstraction in, in politics too. Um, but anyway, you know, the, the diagonal is um, very prevalent in your work. And like I said, one of the pleasures is doing the research for these things. And uh, so I did a, a lot of research into, of course, there's a apocryphal story of Mondrian and Van Doesburg having a falling out over Van Doesburg's introduction of a diagonal. <clears throat> but there's also, you know, all these cross-cultural meanings of the diagonal. When I teach basic design, the diagonal means indeterminacy. Sometimes abstraction is connected to the indeterminate. Um, but, you know, there's also mythic connections to it. And I, again, I don't want to stress this too much and get too romantic about it, but I know you're from Nigeria and so the Nigerian Yoruba legend of Shango is, is a lightning legend. And it's about, on one level, enlightenment. Um, and then there's also, you know, you can think of, you can think of Barnett Newman's zip as kind of like that. And you can also, one could also think of the utopian um, basic, the, the basis of like utopian abstraction in, in, in Russia with uh, the kind of underused term now, Rayanism, which was, uh, Rayanism. Invented by Natalia, well, invented, you know, used by Natalia Goncharova and um, Mikhail Larionov. And so, oh, so that was a utopian project. So, you know, the, so there is this, there's a, there's a cultural, a deep cultural symbolism to the diagonal, but there's also in the history of modern, modernist painting and the canon, if you will, there's a, there's a history of the, uh, the diagonal being used in a, in a kind of utopian way. Um, thank you for bringing up the Rayanism uh, point. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you for bringing that up. It, it, it helps me to go back a little bit into my own project and to remember that uh, 
when I when I initially started it, there were, were there are aspects that wanted to engage information, uh, cinema, and television at the time, and now uh, even greater so relationship to the internet. But I was also thinking about uh, this kind of utopia that would be linked to this idea of the United Nations, this idea of nations united uh, for the pursuit of peace and freedom in the world, this kind of high-minded utopia that came from me through a comic book I had and got when I was a kid. And uh, looking at a lot of the uh, structure of late or high modernist abstraction, there are a lot of these types of shapes that come into to, to view, you know, from suprematism, cubism onward, but they come into, sh they come into kind of like a use, in a way, sort of like a quasi language when you look at late modernist abstraction in the 50s and 60s. And so that's how the painting actually started, thinking about that idea in the sense of my being Nigerian, raised in America, and experiencing um, aspects of this idea, but seeing it in, in ways fail in so many places, but wanting to engage the painting project from that point forward. And this is me coming of age as a student in the 80s, looking at, you know, um, uh, Neo Geo in particular, and um, uh, Neo Expressionism, but this kind of criticality that was about based on this end of history um, notion that is also extremely myopically Western. So it's uh, that that's 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 the kind of historical crux in relation to this idea of abstraction as say a thing, as as, as an object or as an object that has has language, but language that has become silenced over its use. Silenced because those same patterns were found, I would find them on rubber balls at Grand Union and supermarkets like that, or in wallpaper, gift wrap section, you know, for a dollar I can get a, a really fabulous Friedel Zubaz painting, you know. So this is the kind of uh, end game that abstract, that I saw for abstraction at that time. And so then with the diagonal, just to jump to the diagonal, the diagonal, I like what you say about the notion of indeterminate or indeterminacy. In fact, for me, it's, it's a position of change. When you talk about uh, measuring space and X, Y axis, the Z axis is the, is, the, is the diagonal. And that's about space, entering space or exiting space, the transition from here to there. And in a way it speaks to the physical or gets into the three dimensional. Yeah, I love what you said about, you know, finding those sources in, in uh, quotidian, you know, like uh, supermarkets and stuff like that, because, right. you know, you probably know that that's some of the source of my early work. Um, but, you know, it makes it, it makes it more real and it's not based on, uh, you know, maintaining a, a linear narrative. It's, I mean, it, it's experiential. And what you say is really important, actually, because in making it more real in the sense of, that's what it is. You're seeing high modernist abstraction on on, on boxes of of Cheetos. So right. like you're 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 getting this kind of experience in a way that's maybe mis misinformed and misdirected from the original concept of content. Yes. But on another hand, it becomes part of the real world. And then in that sense, it's like what can we do with it, or how can we take it to another place versus just looking at it as only like the failure of modernist painting. Yes, and, and you know what I was saying before about symbolism. Um, it gets rec it got recoup it gets recuperated in industrial design. You know, so mm -hmm. you know the the package of Tide is like a great you know right. it's, it's a great example of like the void. Wonder Bread, you know anything Wonder Bread, right? Chiffon, you know so gas they, stations. You know they're they're great examples, and I I I I I kind of cleave to those early on because I thought well these aren't they're not overdetermined, you know, they're just like in my daily experience. So I, I'm not beholden to art history necessarily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but, it, you know, it, it's a funny thing that I think that uh, the, you know, the, the, the Brillo box, you know, the Brillo design, the Brillo design originally was designed by an artist, you know, who happened to be a designer also. So uh, one of the thing that, things that you also talk about is this distinction between, you know, painting and design and how sometimes design um, gets, you know, like relegated to this 
decorative function. And, uh, I, you know, it makes me think of this critic who was writing on Barnett Newman again, and he said that he was part of the design division of abstract expressionism, which was like a diss, you know, he was, yeah, he, it's an insult. He, was like, he was like, okay, now we're at the design division. It's like a cynical statement. You know? Right, right. Right. No, it, it's, it, I agree. I, I, I look at it like this. I mean, design, I like the Italian word disegno, which is, is the word for drawing. And to me, that's the best way I can think of, of design. It's, it's, it's a form of drawing, a form of structuring uh, and, and, uh, and organizing. But when you are engaging with the framing, design is a sense of framing or balance and, and it kind of a predict, and it creates a certain kind of predictability then I, I believe it doesn't have any use or it becomes valueless. And maybe that's the point of when somebody talks about it in the sense of the decorative or decoration, because it, 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 it certainly starts to lose meaning when it becomes overly determined in a kind of even handed balance that doesn't even, um, it just makes it homogenous and, and boring. Yeah. Right, I mean, it's funny that even in that distinction, like there is a distinction, right? Um, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and a lot of these designs are, you know, if they're from like, you know, they're, they're immemorial, you know, they're, they're rep repetitive and they do, they do have latent symbolic meaning. I mean, they contain symbolic meaning. When I, when I used to deconstruct uh, commercial logos uh, and doing the research, I'd find that, you know, some Celtic origin or, you know, some, uh, some origin in, in uh, uh, like Navajo design, you right. know. But you're talking about something else there because you're talking about the concretization of history. You're talking about history and time of people being collapsed into this kind of design motif. And when you look at those kinds of things, what you see is endless shift, endless shifting shapes, endless shifting space, endless shifting pattern. It just like multiplies endlessly. And that's the kind of thing that I think is magic. And I'm actually interested in that sort of sort of approach where you can go beyond predictability and go beyond uh, uh, basically maybe the structure of the square, you know? Yes, yeah, yeah. And um, <clears throat> one other thing that, I, I, that came to mind when thinking about diagonals was thinking about them as kind of like free radical orthogonals, you know, like, so if we think of the history of Western, you know, painting as determined by early painting determined by the ordering of perspectival, you know, symbolic form. It seems to be what you're doing, and you know, this is just my conjecture, is so you're taking the orthogonal and you're, you're distributing it across a lateral space, which is not a, it's not a determined space per se, like, like it would, might be used in linear perspective. Well, um, for me, like you're bringing up the idea of the horizon, horizontal on the horizon as well. And I, I when I was younger uh, in school, I, I loved this artist named uh, uh, Blinky Palermo. And uh, besides loving an artist named uh, Onkawara for other reasons, but Blinky Palermo, he talked a lot about perif the peripheral and this idea of seeing something at the corner of your eye, uh, at the edge. And for me over time, and this is through really some very uh, generous help with her from Rochelle Feinstein when she was a teacher of mine at Bennington College. Uh, we talked about um, uh, the space of the square and the idea of that within the edge of the square, the canvas, what you have here or what you have in that space is, is the center or the world and that everything outside of the edge of the canvas is, is the peripheral or the non-existent or what I've come to understood came to understood in the, in the in the 90s was the space of the other that everybody everything and every idea else that's not necessarily important or significant the space of the center or the west is placed outside of that canvas square so when i'm dealing with horizon i'm trying to think of a couple of things the idea of of landscape and in particular with the paintings i wanted to be able to in a certain sense picture at multiple things the scape the scape of cinema the scape of say a comic book panel, the scape of, 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 of a television screen with the test band pattern, and also the scape of say, the tourist who goes to some place to dream and vision. So in that sense, I'm put, I, was, I felt as if I was painting uh, my imaginary Africa uh, and, and I was looking at it from outside and not within. I'm looking at it like this. 
you know. And my body then becomes the vertical in the sense that my body becomes the zip. That's the Barnett Newman zip. So to say that that thing about Barnett Newman is to misunderstand entirely what that project is about, but it's to right. see that this is, he's remaking Caspar David Friedrich. You right. know, this is, this is what Barnett Newman is simply doing with those right. stripes. And so in my context, the painting itself was this atmospheric landscape space and the viewer became that, that uh, tourist, that dreamer looking into a space. Right. But at the time of the project, when I was doing the paintings at that time in the early 90s, it, it, and when it became big scale was 1998. That's when I realized this whole thing about the body and the significance of it in relation to the painting. When I got finally to the installations and ha started seeing people do that themselves, my concept was to have my body and the viewer's body with the painting, but at that point, only in one point perspective. When I saw the wall installations and then I saw the expansiveness of space and time being extended in that experience, and then to see the audience without instruction finding a place within the wall painting and asking their friend to take their picture right at that spot, it just like ran full circle when I thought about what I was thinking about originally and this idea of this idea of landscape and body and positioning and space. Yeah, well, that might be a good cue to bring in the slideshow, which you've so wonderfully organized here. So maybe you can talk through the initial slides here. Yeah, um, this, this image is um, of the Zaria Art Society in 1958, the inaugural year of the society at, um, it was at that time the fine art department of the Nigerian College of Arts, Science and Technology. Later, it's been re renamed the uh, Amadou Bello University, Zaria. Um, the Zaria Art Society is also called the Zaria Rebels. Uh, it's significant because the person who is standing in the back row, uh, just at the other side of the bow tie fellow, uh, that's my dad. Uh, that, not, that's just on the, other, at, at the opposite end. Yeah, that guy right there. That guy right there. That's, that's my dad. And he was part of this group. And why it's significant for me being not only for that, but the fact is that this is where change actually starts. It starts with students. It starts with the people who are young like this. Um, from the protesters uh, out there today to the protesters in America in the 60s, to the protesters in Western Europe in the 60s and 70s, to the protesters in the, the different uh, 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 countries in the continent of Africa, all of them have the same impetus of wanting to change their universities or wanting to change the way in which they're being uh, uh, educated in, in this specific case to have it more to have it better fit and adapt to the realities that they want to uh, uh, speak through in their work and in this case they were challenging the curriculum to be able to get to uh, a more stated and purposeful content in their work that was about local politics local ideas and local vision rather than say well, Western European uh, expression through um, through, through art. So this to me is a picture that symbolizes the way in which I wanted to approach my painting ultimately, which is the idea of freedom. Because when I look back at how I was educated, it wasn't about what I could do with possibility in as much as how I could recite the laws of paint, Western painting. It was all about making paintings to recite what I've been taught rather than to use the school skills and use the tools to make something brand new. And this is respective to the idea of content, being able to speak about things that matter to me versus having to speak about things that matter to Western art. So this is um, that. And then this piece right here called Authentic African, um, it's really an American question that I got uh, most of my life growing up in the suburbs in Ohio. Uh, but it's an American question, doesn't mean that it has to be on only in Ohio, which is the authentic African and why. And so this is an image of myself in different uh, symbolic costumes um, with a yes and no test bubble um, uh, underneath each image for the viewer to guess and hopefully maybe pick the right authentic African. It's great to see this early work. Yeah. Yeah, this is all, what happened is after I left graduate school, I went to Ohio State University, then I went to Bennington College, and then I was in New York and, you know, trying to work, trying to make my late high modernist work and 
uh, in graduate school, I was dealing with mulch and computer chips and throwing all this junk in the painting. And when I got to New York, I just stripped it all, just was bare, it was just house paint and canvas. But at a certain point I stopped painting because I didn't feel that painting was really adequately questioning all of the reality I was experiencing in New York, particularly in the early 90s with identity politics. I just wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't working. So I went into photo-based work and I realized in hindsight that my photo-based work was still, I was still thinking as a painter while, while I was making it. But in the case of the work, I think it was hitting on content that at the time I felt like painting wasn't addressing. This space is, this painting, sorry, this image speaks for itself. Uh, what I did is I cut the male out of the picture and just uh, I found an image in a Vogue magazine, cut that male out and put it on a, on a black background and then just blew it up to the size. And um, it was part of my uh, first person show in New York at the, the, uh, the Florence Lynch Gallery. It's great. I love the, um, with that particular image, I love the John Curran in the background. I know it's not, oh, yeah. actually, I know it's not actually a John Curran, but it's no, no, it looks, Yeah. I yeah. mean, it, it makes the context even more rich in a sense because, right. you know, right. and, I, and I also love the title because it's kind of this generic title yes. that leaves the viewer thinking, you know, is this like, you know, behavioral exercise or, you know, like what is, what is my response to this behavioral exercise, you know? Right, 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 right. Yeah, this one again, it's an object and taking the term, the title is object. It, it's, in essence, the objects are many things. It's the, uh, either the wallpaper uh, photocopies. Those are photocopies that wallpaper the back from a film still called Walk with a Zombie. Uh, the images of a black male being found with flashlight by a, uh, a white female. And, uh, you know, so I was thinking a lot about the idea of discovery of Africa as this dark continent. Um, uh, the light bulbs in front of the uh, black pigmented uh, rectangles are formally paralleling what's happening in the image where again it's this discussion between white and black i'm using the idea of you know value scale to speak about the work uh in this in a particular context and so it's heightening this notion of discovery and then at the end of the day for me the piece is called object or in act in action i object All right so it's multivalent again it's a hinge mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I could see in this piece too, not to, you know, to put too fine a point on formalism, but I could see the formal uh, aspect of the arrangement coming in, you know. Yeah, it's, I'm, make, I'm making space. I'm making space in a flat context. Right. Yeah. And there's different spaces, the photograph space, the photocopied space, the, right. the electronic space, the space of the pigmented those those rectangles actually have material that you can see mm -hmm. on them. You could touch them. So it's this other kind of tactile space. So the senses are being incorporated in many different ways. It's kind of this rhythmic thing that art can do. Right. And it refers back to what you were talking about in terms of the lateral extensivity of the space rather than the, the limit being, you know, the square. Right. Right. I love that about cinema too. You, you know, just the idea of, you know, the big screen, the, the idea that it's endless, the idea of the pictures versus the text. At the end, you get this text that just rotates upward. And right. for me, it was always, where does this begin? You got, right. it begins at one edge, ends at the other edge. And does it, does it literally continue? You have that Star Wars opening where the lit let letters are made to go like pyramidical into the space, like perspectival. Right. Right. But in the case of this film ending, it just kind of just goes up and then, disappears but what happens after that edge and that was always my in a sense my question relation relating to like information relating to yes. culture relating to ideas and societies yeah you could probably critique that star wars perspective is kind of uh, reactionary you know in a, in a way yeah you know what i mean like in the terms of what you're saying it's like you know it's much more interesting to see the scrolling and then the picture and then like this lateral kind of extension that's kind of very vir vir virtual and, and what, what you said is very smart and very quick. It's very smart what you said, because the thing is that over time I've, I've come to understand that perspectival space is not as big or as dominant as cubistic space. There's more space in cubism than there is in perspective, perspectival space. And yeah. why? It's because we have the computer. When you think of the idea and notion of what the computer screen exactly. is and what yeah. it does with all the hyperbox, hypertext boxes there, and then the imagination that happens and comes into 
into the fact that you're absorbing information of all kinds, reading things, imagining things, looking at things. You're, you're realizing, I think, in a way that you can realize that this relationship is expansive more than, than a quasi-literal of perspective. And it's yeah. not to say, it's not to put a downer on figuration, because I think figuration is, this is what I see. I, for, for me, the best figuration is highly abstract in the way that it deals with its, its items, those right. things that we look at in the figurative painting, versus the way in which uh, the best abstraction can bring us to a sense of reality that is yeah. more, that can be as real as what we see and touch around us and hear and feel around us. And it's not that abstraction is a limitation, but it's in fact a means of getting to the point and opening right. one's self up to possibility. Yeah, I think there was one Barnett Newman painting called The Death of Euclid. Mm -hmm. And I think he's, he's talking, you know, he's kind of inferring that, that kind of organized space. You know, in, in a way, what you're saying about, you know, like lateral space and computer reality is it, it, it's, you can understand like a, a, a Barnett Newman painting much more, much more clearly now. Yeah, it's like, it's so, it's so, it's so simple, right? right? But I don't mean that in a, in a pejorative way. I mean, it's just no, so, of course, it's, so no. it's so beautiful, right? So, you know, he, he has that, oh, let's, let's go, go ahead, just, I'm sorry. No, 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 I'm just, I'm just responding to what, what you just said. No, that's Barnett. a good word. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So this is oh sorry this is uh this is this is Powerline looking at this painting what is this uh, this is this is Powerline and um, it was uh, again based on just there was a certain thing that happened with this line I didn't realize this particular yellow whitish line in the middle of the painting in a way was was very significant to me at the time when I was making this painting just like this way of cutting through the space and now I look at it with some better sense of knowledge of what I did it's like okay. I'm dealing with these, you know, these um, value vibrations and these chromatic hues. And there's a certain overall dullness or darkness. When I squint and look at it, I can see that the other colors operate in this kind of tonal space versus these separate uh, or singular colors. There's an energy in them that in fact makes them almost like flashlights in a darkened space. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of that, I was thought of them simply as a power line, but I can metaphorically go into different kinds of considerations of what this, this is meaning. But in fact, I feel it's like me continually to continue, continuing my search through the painting. And then on another level, I was beginning to think of these abstractions as physical spaces in a realistic sense. And right. so that darkened color, that brown black shape that's in there, to me it becomes like the shattered body. So this ripping line that goes and dis gets dismembered becomes my body or a body that's electrified or a body that's stretched. Um, be me up, Scotty, you know? It's, 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 it's particularized, it's molecularized and it's being moved into space. And moving you know, through the, space. the way you're describing the painting is wonderful, uh, it, but it also brings up this issue for me of like, um, I think, you know, one pejorative phrase of like, say, post minimalist, minimalist was like, you know, the paintings too, or the, the works too anecdotal, like it, it, it like it depends. I'm not talking about this painting, but I'm talking about in general, that was like a critique of work that didn't stand on its own phenomenologically, you know, like it needed, uh, it needed a, a referential, um, libretto or something. Um, so when I look at this painting, like my body responds to it as these, but also anecdotally, like I'll make these anecdotal associations of my own uh, because of the suggestion of the, of the title. For me, there's like in the middle of this painting, there's kind of like a, a lag, you know, there's kind of like that weight of like a power line. Um, but also simultaneously, the, there's this refractory energy. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's an interesting, the tension for me exists between the drawing, which has this kind of like weight, this kind of, it's like weighted in the middle kind of, it feels like it's sagging down. But at the same time, the, 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 the refractory energy, which you're talking about like the light in the dark room or something like that, or like, like a diamond where like one facet is more, um, refracting more light than another so it's it, you know so so for it's like the indeterminacy of, of of abstraction like this 
is expansive. It's not reductive. Right. I mean, it, it, you know, one could speak simply and say like, it's, it keeps, it keeps moving or it keeps changing. Yes. I mean, you could say it like that. I could talk about that and say, but that's an important element here. I don't want it to just sit, rest still and be um, predictable. Uh, I've avoided like the late, more recent work that I'm do, doing and the patterning I'm dealing with and more of a recent work was, would have been challenging for me to have done it back at that time because I didn't believe in a certain kind of this idea that there can be something seemingly static and yet uh, moving. Uh, movement was very much a part of the work in the idea of my sources being music, being uh, thinking of speed and time. Um, thinking of distance, remoteness, and, and, and place. But it's when understanding the nature, relationship between drawing and color or drawing and painting and the simplicity of this relationship can produce so much enormity, it's to realize that uh, you, you kind of have the world at your fingertips, but it's about being able to be relaxed enough to trust that every time you go into it. Uh, because it's such a shocking thing to see I see this painting, I'm like, wow, it looks pretty good. And I'm like, what, what did I do? And he's like, how did I do that? And so then I have to say, like, I, I have to trust myself and trust my sense of drawing, which my dad, dad my father, being an artist, uh, turned into an art historian. He always stressed drawing mm -hmm. to the point that I was annoyed with that. And, in, and, and, I, and I, for a long time, took it for granted. But drawing is, is like, it's everything. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's everything. And so it helps to control and hold rather paint and helps to make paint and color become space. And you have to be able to understand how the two relate to each other. Uh, Robert Bordeaux was so great. Uh, I was working in one of his classes at Cooper Union. He was so great to mention to me the fact that uh, 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 Franz Klein uh, drew a lot of his... Uh, paintings on post-it type things and then basically blew them up. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, oh, so that's why his drawing is always kind of bad because <laughs> it's just a, a blow up of right. something rather than how does drawing that sits in one space work right. when you move the drawing or move drawing over to another space because the fact of painting, just like anything else, paintings are not the same the space of a painting is not the same from one thing to the next. Where the painting is situated is not, does not make it the same thing if it's in, hung in this place, place A, and then hung, is, painting X is hung in place A, and then painting X is hung in place B. This is not the same experience. So it's to understand how things can change and how, and, and at the end of the day, there's a certain kind of organic and physiological and psychological thing that happens in each moment. I love what you said about, um, you know, looking back on this painting and then thinking about it in terms of like um, your, your internal progression, like your conceptual progression and your, and your literal, you know, progression in the studio. I, I don't know if like a lot of people understand that. I mean, most artists understand that, but like, it's so interesting when you go to, a, a, you know, say like a retrospective, if you're a painter or an artist, you, you can kind of, you can kind of see where it starts to click, you know, uh, not in terms of like the signature style necessarily, but you can tell where the artist starts to trust themselves, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like they're not leaning on the armature of whatever, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, so, so, and maybe it's that trust that's the indeterminate, you know, it's like the indeterminate, it's very hard to uh, criticize because it's indeterminate, you know? Well, there's, there's, it's called strength and confidence, and particularly confidence, being able to just say that you can allow yourself to do something. And then you question it before the fact, and it's one thing. If you question it after the fact, it's something completely different. Yeah. But um, if there's a certain awareness that's imbued in that trust that you know that something's at stake. And that's what makes trust so uh, righteously valuable because you're not just saying, oh, I trust myself. Uh, where's my chewing gum? It's like, I, 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 I trust myself and I know that I can fall off this rope doing it, but I trust myself to go right. across this space. Right. So let's, yeah, let's take another look at a painting. Yeah, this is called Nomad uh, 2012. Uh, I was really starting to restructure the way that I wanted to deal with 
the the painted space. I, I in a way there's I thought of this this as a top, middle, and bottom, and the top and the bottom kind of relate and connect to each other. And this middle portion is a, like a a field of play. Um, this field of play is a, a play maybe of uh, I look at it as like is is it like clusters, grouping, dismemberment. Uh, for reform formations and reformations space within space within space within space but the idea of nomad as a title was reflective of this kind of traveling body and as much as as the way in which all these spaces shift these colors and spaces shifted with no sense of location uh, in in the painting you know it's funny I think there used to be a car called a nomad and so, so for me, like the immediate association to this was like California car culture, mm -hmm. but that just shows you how, like, you know, you can bring your own enculturation to an abstraction, you know, as an entry point and then like understand it on its own terms. I mean, that's, that's a very important. It's, a, it's, be, it's being able to allow that to happen versus right. overdetermine the yeah. experience to say like, okay, it's only about this or it's only this thing. I, I learn a lot from what what people can say about the thing because it does speak directly to their cultural references, yes. and that's the thing that's really, I think, very important. Particularly when you want to understand work that is not from, say, your foundation or your space. I truly hate the way in the West that uh, a lot of artists like uh, like Alma Thomas, like Jack Whitten, um, you know, Sam Gilliam, any of these artists as profound as they are. Uh, Howardina Pendel, you know, as profound as they are, in certain cases, uh, Norman Lewis, they were taken as second rate artists only because the frame was Western art or Western, uh, uh, Western painting, Western art. The thing is that one has to understand the context from which the person is speaking from and the platform from which they are, they're, they're addressing the, their references. So I cannot look at Carole Schneemann and say, this is, um, uh, 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 Robert Morris, let's say, that she has a different set of considerations that she's engaging in the work to make it what it is. And the, what has happened to a lot of these black artists is that because they saw the forms, the material, the drawing, the, the con let's say the visual concept, the formal concepts only as, oh, it relates to our guys. Okay, I've seen this before, so that's then hence second rate, which is just totally incorrect. It's to say, it's the better ask, what are they talking about? Where does this sound, visual sound come from? Where does this visual context, how does this visual context exist within the history of America? Not one story of America, but the history of America. And so I think this is a massive re-education that's happening even as we see the protests from George Floyd going on, there's a massive re-education, at least at the, starting to, people are starting to reflect on, for example, George Floyd. Oh, this guy died without, without mercy given, and he has a family, and uh, some people miss him. Oh, he has a family. Oh, he's a human being. Let's actually start to consider that black people are human beings. Here, we can say the same thing in art, where we go, oh, these artists are human beings and they have experiences that are unique to themselves as human beings. And let's try to engage those ideas to see why this thing exists as it does versus it doesn't look like our stuff. So, or it looks like our stuff that we've seen before. So then it's second rate. Right, and conversely too, the, I think the other thing that happens often is um, there's this weird thing that happens with, you know, say like, um, Oh God, I'm, I'm just blanking on his name. Uh, he died young, he's a colorist, kind of Matissean. Uh, Bob Thompson. Bob Thompson, right. So, so you know, I, I, I referenced Matisse there. And so, yeah, you could look at him, uh, like you said, like as a second rate version of Matisse, but you could also not deny him that that's part of his history too, you know? That color is profound. And that color is as profound as Stanley Whitney's color. Stanley Whitney's color is unique. The way he explores and deals with it, it's unique. Yeah. Same thing in the same way with Jack Whitten, for example. And yeah. that's to be seen exactly in Bob Thompson. He's understood that way. But I've met, I actually, I'm not going to say his name here because this guy is very famous. And this guy was very stupid when he said, oh, this second rate guy, da, 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 like a Basquiat. I could not believe it. But that's, that's like, um, 
you know, that's before Me Too, that's before being woke, that's before all of that. Yeah, well, the thing, you know, he's a great example. Basquiat's a great example because, you know, you can think about Pollock, like, you know, assimilating, like, Siqueiros, you know? Yeah. And you can, and you can think about Basquiat assimilating uh, uh, Gustin or, or um, de Kooning, and that's, you know, that's part of their culture, too. You yeah, know? I mean, some so, people so, say- So why, why is the assimilation seamless if, if it's done by somebody who's like closer to that narrative, you know? Yeah, yeah. Or if it's been brought up in my work as well. Uh, Stamatina Gregory uh, wrote about it. She talks about how, in a way, I'm doing a, re a, re a reverse assimilation, in a way, maybe taking something back uh, from abstraction or within abstraction to re- Re, re to give it new possibility, not only reclamation, but to revitalize it in a way in which it might have been vital before, or to revitalize it in the way that it can be something different. Right, and you know, and that comes back to that idea of the utopian, um, which you know, it often gets it often gets kind of like you know shifted to the side. It's like we we were once believers. And, you know, it's not possible anymore. You know, a lot of the narrative of postmodernism is about mm -hmm. not projecting the, the romantic subject, you know, into a utopian collectivity. <clears throat> I think the, the, the thing ultimately is, is to respect the notion that there, was high, there were high stakes put into abstraction and there were high stakes put into art in general, just, you know, the, 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 the progression of art the progression of painting, the progression of art. And for us to be able to come to a, you know, a, a sense of the death of painting or the death of art is to, on one hand, understand that our relationship to these monuments has changed in the way in which you see people out, out there now pulling down monuments off of their pedestal. It's to say that the situation within these things has changed. It's not to disregard the intent from the beginning up till now, but it's to see how, and this is relates to, you know, an idea my dad has always told me that tradition and those values stay alive if and when they adapt to the present and when they become useful and still maintain use value in the present. So it's not about maintaining something just because it happened, but to find out and find ways in which what has happened is still useful and in views and in value today. Right, that's basic Dewey like pragmatism. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, and it's true, I mean, they, they, don't, they don't have any relevance if they don't have, you know, relevance. Right. I love the title of this piece. Great Divide. Um, this is uh, from um, uh, my show uh, in 2017, 2018, um, Third Son, and this, painting is conceptually doing a lot of things. It's, it's, it's in a way it's mir it mirrors itself. It mirrors itself and yet breaks, it's, 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 um, breaks the idea of, of, uh, of over, over determined balance and harmony by the ways in which color shifts to basically break the framing or break the structure of, of, of closure. And then this divide, which is, uh, um, it has a certain color, it's like a reddish brown color. Maybe it's a space of skin. Maybe it's a space of an idea. Uh, maybe this is the space which is creating the divide or, in, or, or, or notif makes noticeable the divide within a, a geograph geography or within a landscape. Um, so there's, a, in the ways in which I'm working, I realize I'm not necessarily wanting to claim and proclaim answers to things or so give answers to things and as much as ask questions and make one think about uh, what they're seeing and, and why they're seeing this sort of thing. So is it um, a question about modern modernity and the space of painting? Mm -hmm. is, this, is this brown line breaking that color space? Is it shifting, reshifting the notion of a holistic space? Or is it uh, some other thing as like what I mentioned earlier? Well, we had a wonderful conversation about color theory when we first met virtually. Um, so, you know, when I look at a painting like this, I love the title because it's very elusive, but mm -hmm. when I look at what's happening with the color, 
uh, with that line, I think of like Albers kind of the middle color exercise, you know, what the middle colors is kind of demilitarized zone between, you know, whether they're assimilative or contrasting colors. But it always winds up being kind of like an under, like an undersaturated, you know, light or dark color. So for me, and we talked a little bit about this, like, you know, how, how Albert's formal exercises can be, you can extrapolate meaning from those. So as if the underdetermined color in the middle takes on, you know, it could take on political content just because it's, it's both unifying and separating the, the, the two colors, you know. Here's the thing with the, that's, uh, Albers is a, is a, Joseph Albers, I think is, um, I don't know if he was a racist or anything like that or a hateful person, but his, his book is amazing to me, Interaction of Color, because it's so much about this idea of this possibility of having a better world, uh, wow. because he talks about interaction and interactivity. And that space you're talking about, that third color, what I understand and how I teach it to students, I say, you know, that third color is not just a mix of one and two. It's not literal. That third color, which looks like the in-between, is a third color. It is its own notion as well. And right. when I take, it, take my mind to that space, I'm like, wow, that's amazing. It's not, because if you're talking about paint, which is a subtractive color, right. or as in like, when you mix A with B, you get, it breaks down. It doesn't break it doesn't build up, it actually breaks down and goes to gray, you know, right. as, as you mix, so it's subtractive. But to understand that that mixing is not, that third thing is not just something less. It's actually unique and it's more. Right. That's to me uh, a very interesting thing. So whatever A is and whatever B is, if they don't have to be hetero, they don't have to be homo, they just are things separate from each other that makes a third thing right that is like positivity to me well what i find interesting in this painting is like you know it's and it's probably because i do that in my own work like you know i'll sometimes i'll build in like a what i can what i call a semantic element which is like a third color which kind of acts like a greek chorus to the other colors you know mm -hmm. like it qualifies the other colors it doesn't really, it does, it does its own thing, but it's qualifying the yellow colors at the same time. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it makes a world, you know, it, it makes a world of experience within the painting. At the same time, I found it's interesting. Sometimes it could just make, you know, that third color, which is, you know, if you're not adept at color theory or anything, it, it might seem like nothing. You know, it might seem, it might seem like a void. Uh, but for but I understand where you're coming from in terms of it setting up a situation where it creates a world. That void is actually very important because sometimes that void is where you have silence. You know, uh, right. that the in Quaker spaces you have the meeting house, you have that empty center. In uh, James Terrell, you have the same empty center in a lot of his space, his work, because he's creating these meeting houses for people to have that silence to contemplate, and that so that void is sometimes. Uh, very important. Right. And, it, you know, I mean, that's a Zen thing, right? I mean, that's, uh, yeah. But this is a great segue, I think, because, you know, the, the edge condition, to use uh, Albert's term, you're really playing with edge condition here and, and, and dark and values in terms of, you know, like the, the, this, this center thing that's addressing the back thing is backlit. And so there's this all this stuff going on. Right, right. I mean, it's, it's a lot of the painting is about play and a lot of the wall installation is about play in space. And it's also trying to, I'm trying to play with the structure of what a painting is in a lot of these cases with, the, with these kinds of paintings or what a painting can be or can be seen as. And in this sense, I mean, is this, the, is this my version of the Last Supper? Or right. is this a window uh, into another internal interior space that has a different temperature over, say, a different emotional space. Right. So also I'm dealing with the way in which the eye might connect edges. I love the thing about in Gary Winogrand uh, photographs uh, where you have uh, an, uh, one side of the picture and a tree breaking up the space and then something happens on the other side of the tree that doesn't connect to, uh, to the first side. So 
it's these visual tricks and visual play where you're, con you're trying to connect things, but they don't literally connect. So it keeps this perceptual energy and conceptual energy alive in the looking. Yeah, and that's the exact same thing, you know, when you were talking about figuration, figurative work, figurative painting. It's the exact same thing, a simultaneous contrast that energizes a Vermeer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, those edges where there's a simultaneous contrast between color or light and dark keeps that whole thing like perpetually energized. It has yeah. nothing to do, it creates a drawing armature, but it really has nothing to do with the subject. It's a, it's a phenomenal thing that happens with color. Yeah, and I loved that as a kid. I just loved it in comic books. I mean, I, knew, I learned that just for looking at comic books right. you know, and the color and the drawing together. Maybe we could start to look at some of the installations because yes. uh, I, think, yes. I think, yeah. I mean, yeah, so, so this is, uh, was this in um, the Venice yeah. Biennale? That was yeah, this, by Rob Store, right? Right, 52nd Venice Biennale. This is a, a space I had positioned between, that black painting at the very end is uh, Sigmar Polke. And the room right before this room was uh, Nancy Spiro. So I was really in a really beautiful, I was in a really beautiful space between these two artists. Um, this was the transitional space. So I understood it in that way. And I really made it to reflect what I was experiencing in Venice every day during the install because my family, we were there for about five weeks to install this piece uh, before the opening of the, the, the Biennale. Uh, so the color down below represents a type of uh, reflection of light off the water versus the arches of the, the wall above. Uh, the light is sort of like the buildings that we would see uh, uh, then cruising on the Vaporettos uh, and the boats from one place to the next. And I wanted to realize that this work and work like this that you see later will be about the space. I wanted the work to come in and be rel have relationship to the space that it was situated in versus this jet set artist thing of just going into a place, hanging something off of a nail and then leaving when the, uh, the show opening is, is done. Right, I mean, you know, the, the international jet set thing can be problematic, obviously. Right, right, right. right. Um, I have a question, you know, like you, 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 you were talking about like experiential things in Venice as inspiration for those pieces. How important is it for you that those experiences translate like to the viewer the same way? Um, it's just important for me as a means of motivation. Mm -hmm. I mean, I use it as a way of trying to make something. Right. The clarity of the work is not to be something like a letter, this letter equals that letter, or this number right. equals that number, but it's really about, you know, uh, I call it the spiritual, artistic integrity of motivation, just being able to have the reason to make something and to plan something and to try to make it work. So it's, it's um, that's important to me because it, 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 it makes something more real than, than not real. And color is very, uh, just to say, just to say the same thing in another way, it's that one could think that you can pick up, up, up any old, you know, pick up any old can of color and just like throw it on, on a space. And it doesn't work like that because you have different things that happen with color. Like right. if you took uh, words from the alphabet and just started sticking them together, sometimes you might accidentally make a word clear and other times you'll just have gibberish. Right. So it's a matter of really understanding what you're using, the potential potency of it. And that's what uh, the work is always, the gaming of this work is always about that. Like, can't, will it fail? You know, trying not to fail. How can it push itself within a given space? And it's also very real to think about, like, this is, this is something that's gonna get me motivated, but I'm not, I'm not, it, it's not my responsibility to make that motivation, like, representational somehow, you know? Right. I mean, well, I think the responsibility I have as an artist and with, with even thinking of that question is a matter of just having a sense of, 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 you know, having a sense of import within myself, a sense of clarity within myself to be able to communicate and not necessarily letting myself rely only on old tricks, but to use what I know to make something new. Right. And, and the, the new is not literally form. It could be the way in which I did made the form and the way in which the form allows me to understand something deeper about form or the way in which form allows me to understand something deeper about content or motivation and so forth. So it's about pushing myself and that's, that's the ambition. 
that I believe is inherent, not only in the abstraction project, which I think is primarily what the abstraction project is about, this ambition to be able to reach uh, maybe the center of the mind as in the center of the universe and, and speak about it. Yeah, you have that great quote. I, let me just find it somewhere. Um, uh, that. And this is third. This is third space at um, at the ICA and uh -huh. uh, in at the University University of Pennsylvania. And this is uniquely interesting painting because you have the painting which is in the hall. This hall space, very tall, vertical, narrow hall space, and all this shifting of 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 is happening within the painting to talk about the shifting of movement in the space. And in the next slide, you have what becomes a traditional painting in the sense that that you see everything at once from a perspective, from a point of perspective. And in the case of this image, I have to stand across the street and look at the building to get the, this kind of, to get this image. So the context of body space and relationship to this painting or the image is really, was profoundly experiential to me in my understanding of what's possible, that I have to stand across the street to get that, to get that understanding. And it's interesting to look at this installation in relation to that painting place because there's a similar kind of like light interplay between something that's in shadow and something that's in light. Right. So there's a dialogue between the installations and the, and the standalone paintings that's also extensive. It's not like they're not like two different things. No, I mean, in fact, you know, my color in my canvas paintings became better after the installations in particular because I had this prejudice with color, which I think is really important to understand that when we want to assign things too much uh, meaning at the beginning, we limit those things and, and hence we don't allow them to become whatever is outside of our mind, but that can soon become part of our mind. So for me, with respect to this, I was thinking of making paintings that represented and using color that represented, say, a so-called African color. Over time and through the install, that became the most ridiculous thing I could ever imagine doing, which I spent a few years thinking through and thinking about. Not that the work failed, but that I understood something that in particular, there's no sort of kind of classification that it can put to color in that way to say that this is like Japan, is this Japanese color? Right. Is this American color? You know, you might have states that have flags and they use colors and you might have countries that have flags that use colors, but that's not to say that this represents that space or that thing and for me then i started to realize any color is african color like any color is whatever color you just have to be able to go beyond uh these preconditions that limit and that's again another relationship i have uh, this this growing relationship i have to art to painting where it's like undoing my education i was taught by good teachers but if i talk about white supremacy and the systemic nature of of knowledge in the west I'm going to say that my whole practice is about going beyond that in as much as I think in the world, that's what all this protest is about. We're going beyond not only just white supremacy or male, male, uh, fas male fascism, but we're going into the space of trying to go beyond these determined determinants, maybe language itself that limits. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. Um, and it's probably the, it's the political dimension of abstraction, you know, it yeah. could, it's, it's one element of the political, you know, and so, you know, sometimes in the past, formal abstraction was seen as, again, you know, like retrograde or uh, fascist even, you know, when you connect it to like the futurists and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, formalism is a bad word, it became a bad word in the early 90s, you know, uh, and it was opposed to the figure, it was like a false dichotomy. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the fascism, argument, and fascism, you know. fascism in art and fascism in, you know, just art in general can still exist in, in a way in which it's not only represents some, some ideal or idealism, but in ways in which it, it, it projects its, the force of its form. I'm interested in looking at things of that nature because it's about understanding or just responding actually to, to power and, yes. and, and, and understanding how it can image itself and what it, what and how, it, and how does that, how does it do that, you know? Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, so I think, I think we want to, we, I, I don't want to rush this because this is excellent. I, I, but I think we want to get to some questions and answers yeah. and, yeah. You know, I, I love to hear questions that I'd never heard before predicted. So, 
but but let's go through the rest of the um, the installations because I think I remember seeing a, a video where you were talking about can you you take into consideration like the students and everything like what is the student's experience so you're not just it's not just subject centered you're also projecting your installations into a social situation yeah I mean the, the, in, at the end of the day these people have to be around this work and 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 this um these things. Um, I mean, Richard Serra is a great artist, but it's still interesting to think about his tilted arc and the, you know, the contest of this, this work um, at the time. I remember hearing about it when I was a student, I think of you know, undergrad, and uh, people were, you know, there was the idea of this guy's an artist. He has to say what he needs to say. It's his, his voice. He's an artist. You know, he's got the power to say what he's going to say, and they can't take down an artist's work and all this sort of thing. And, 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 and you, know, I, you know, it's hard for me to appreciate that argument because it's sort of like people had to walk all the way left or right to walk all the way back to center to go to the front of the building. So on one hand, it was a conceptual project, which I think is interesting when you want to talk about time and the way in which he was trying to force people to engage their time at the same instance people had to walk all the way one way come all the way back just to get to the front of the building. So if it was an act of protest, that's one thing, but it was you know, pr proposed, maybe it was poorly sold. It was proposed as an object of art. And as an object of art, it was not necessarily functioning. It was, inter it was, it was interjecting in a way that it was seemed um, uh, suspect. And so it's to say, what is this object really? Or maybe it was, mis it was mis um, missold. Well, yeah, and there was this whole argument about like this, the, this mythical man on the street, you know, who, who you know, and it, it gets to these arguments of populism that are currently, you know, afoot. So it, it's a very complex argument with the, the tilted arc, but I, I see your point, you know. Um, well, oh, and I think it is populist. So there is a populism in, in there. And I think there's a danger on one hand when one thinks about the, the notion of populism, but it's, it's on a certain level, you got to, put, I have to put trust into it as well, because it's sort of like the motivation to take down these sculptures by people across the world is profound. But I think it's become profoundly acute because people are actually, and have been through time, thinking about this. This is not just some rage reaction, right. some instant kind of thing. This is a collection of the public putting their mind to something that's, that's very important, very critical at this time. And that's part of the action of change that they want to engage. So to me, it's really exciting to see people being active with art. I don't want to call it public art versus what is art in the gallery, private art? No, I think it's art. And I think that they are saying something about the art that they're seeing every day. And they're saying, we don't want this art to represent our voices now because it doesn't represent us now. Right. What's interesting about that is like, you know, for most people, those, I shouldn't say for most people, it's generalization, but those, those statues after a while, they kind of become invisible, you mm -hmm. know, as, as, as aesthetic objects, like they're, right. they're, never, they're never really considered seriously as aesthetic objects, you know, right. they're, they're always seem like, you know, like some based on some neoclassical idea of heroism or something like that. To me, that's really super interesting, though, because I think of when I go to Western Europe, when I go to Switzerland and places like that, some of the you know, more advanced artists in the sense of more conceptually advanced artists, they seem to want to make work that has that same kind of notion of disappearing and becoming a real part of the social space. And so it's an interesting question about what is what does art do? Does it does it does it have to stay separate? And do we have to notice it like we would maybe notice a religious object or something? Right. Or is it can it become real in the sense that in a lot of real cases people just know it's there but forget it's there, but they know it's there. <laughs> you know, it's like what situation or condition does the art object have to maintain, and does it have to maintain that situation or condition at all times? Right. I mean, one of the one of my favorite critiques of my own work was David Hammond said, "Oh, you're making paintings not to be looked at." <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "Oh, that's great." You know, it's like I I kind of understand what he meant. You know, it's kind yeah. of exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. You know?
there's different conditions. And I hope he would go on to say, well, then it's doing a da, da, da. Well, he wouldn't because he doesn't, you know, he doesn't do that. Right. He doesn't give you the punch. I'm, I'm teasing. He just gives you the, he just gives you, you, know, you, you wind up being the straight man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but on some level, I understood what he meant. You know, I understood that what, that there's a certain ambition to becoming kind of like seamlessly, you know, connected to like some no, no aesthetic argument, you know, it's like. Right, right. Anyway, um, so how are we doing on time, Nick? And we, I think we got okay. maybe we got a couple more. We're almost done. I mean, it's like okay. maybe, All right. we can just run through these even just kind of fast. Sure. Yeah. I'd like to talk about this one ideally because this looks like there's a performance involved with this yes. piece. Yes. Uh, this is a piece I did at the at the at Yale University University um, Ezra Stiles College in their Commons room there, and uh, this is uh, was a really beautiful performance to inaugurate the piece. And these images come in to show this kind of social dynamic that's occurring with the wall installations, how they're being used by people and how people are activating them and become, they're becoming something else. Not just say a background, as much as how the energy of the work itself inspires the, the people and the people inspire the energy in the, in the painting. So there's a kind of a back and forth dialogue that's happening. And then some with of the other slides. Collaboration, collaboration with a, a performance group or? Well, this was, I was surprised. I didn't know this would happen. They, they brought this performance. These are students from Yale. They, they're like a, a social, they're, they're, they're a choir, a group of people coming together and they, they wanted to perform in front of this, this wall. This wall painting was very important for the school itself because they wanted to in, enact and engage more people of color in projects uh, in, 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 on the campus itself. They chose me for that. Uh, they wanted to um, uh, essentially uh, go against some of the histories of like the whiteness that permeates most of that institution and try to bring something um, uh, more reflective of the changing student population at that school. I love this image. Yeah, it's beautiful. I love it too. Just those bodies in front and this one as well. Uh, this is a dancer performing in front of this piece, Shadow and Light, that's at the uh, Nasher Museum of Art at Duke University. Uh, this is in commemoration to Julian Francis Abel, who was an architect of, of some of the most important buildings on that campus, but was never able to see those buildings because of uh, Jim Crow laws at the time. Um, there was a um, protest um, uh, in the 80s, and uh, people forgot about this. Somebody mentioned in, a, in a, some kind of letter to the editor of the school paper that the creator, of the builder of all these buildings will be so and it was a protest happening for divestment from South Africa at that time in the 80s. The person said, uh, the, the, person, the architect of this place will be so dishonored by all this protest happening here. And then his, Julian Francis Abel's granddaughter, who was at the school at the time, wrote to the paper, no, he would not. He wasn't even able to see these buildings. And only maybe that he was snuck on campus that he was able to visit his architecture. And this guy was, Julian Francis Abel was the uh, president of his class, class president of of uh, the University of uh, Pennsylvania's architecture school. And he went on to build the Widener Library and other profound buildings, uh, including the drawings for the Philadelphia Museum of Art. So it's like, uh, it's, it's to say that this title of the painting, Shadow and Light, refers to how this guy was in the shadows and now with an understanding of how, of what he did, not only here, but elsewhere in America, that it's, we, I wanna put it to light. I wanted to put this knowledge to light. It, these two photos are also a great uh, example of how um, abstract painting can become part of a situation, you know, yes. like, like they, they take on another life based on their installation. Yeah. I love this too. At Bennington College, it was a beautiful experience to be able to like have this kind of multidisciplinary, uh, like it's, there's a vogue in speaking about multidisciplinary uh, 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 education in, in art schools and in general. But when I was there in the 80s, it was late 80s, it was really um, that kind of experience for me, you know, working with dancers and theater people and musicians and just this whole integration and interaction with the arts. So I love this image. For me, it's a, it's a, very, uh, it's, it's a very positive image. 
And it's it's very close to the social sculpture called the Brooklyn Rail. I mean, it's it's yeah. what the Brooklyn Rail represents us in terms of a a real mixed bag in terms of experience. You know? Yeah, and the potentials that can come out of it without judgment. You know. Yeah. This is uh this one here ta constellation. It's made uh, in the, for the front of the National Cleveland Triennial of Contemporary Art. To me, like this is where I'm thinking of figuration as well. Like. There, that empty center, there's, in the center, there's this kind of zigzag shape. To me, that's like a body, this brown body, a brown goddess, and she's like spreading her arms in this wing pattern. And so on one hand, it's this. On the other hand, it's this kind of vibration of, of rhythms that become central to, I was thinking of tire marks, you know, just like marks like that. But I was also thinking of this kind of invisible force that is behind the light that exists on the wall. I love that re reference to the sacred and the profane. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, Ford Foundation, Freeform. Uh, this is on the second floor, uh, the Ford Foundation Center for Social Justice. And this last image uh, from my project at Prospect for the Indivisible and Invincible, a monument of, to Black liberation and celebration in the city of New Orleans. When I was doing my research, it just struck me how much history is in New Orleans relating to social justice actions and trying to um, create change, uh, not only in the locations within this, these places in the South, but also how this city spurred so much change that really uh, went across the country. And not only in, in a singular moment, but throughout time, throughout the time of the uh, formation of, 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 of America. So these flags that I've put in all these different places were markers to where uh, uh, political action and black action took place in the city. And this was one of the 17 spots. Yeah, and I doubt there's any statues to Butler who was like the union general who took over um, New Orleans like very early in the war. It was liberated very early in the Civil War. Mm, mm, mm. This place in particular, Congo Square, this is where the, uh, 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 slaves and free slaves were um, able to celebrate. They were able to have market there and dance and, and perform. They were not able to do that anywhere else in the city. And, and New Orleans is also one of these multicultural places. You know, it's a river town. You know, it's, it has this kind of like indeterminate populace that makes up you know, this very rich kind of cultural tradition. It has, it has spirits and it has ghosts. Yes. And they're all walking around at the same time. Yes. So, so thank you so much. It's so good. So, such an excellent discussion uh, to get to know your work better. And I'm sure that uh, our guests will come up with some excellent questions as well. So I'll hand it off to uh, is it, Nick. Are you fielding the questions? I am. And uh, thank you so much, Odili and Tom, for this really oh, dynamic you. conversation. I'm really grateful to have been here for it today. Thank you. Uh, we have lots of really great questions, so we're just going to go right into it. Um, first question is coming from our friend Deanna. And Deanna, I am going to activate your mic now. Hi, Nick. And uh... Tom and Odili, thank you so much for this amazing talk. Um, and thank you to the rail for letting me um, participate in this conversation. Um, I, I just wanna say super grateful to this, um, for bringing in the political dimension of abstraction. Um, that I, you know, like we, we respond to color, line, shape, everybody does, mm -hmm. you know, all these meanings are conveyed that are interpreted according to each of our cultural, social positions. and that it, um, I think that it's, it's wonderful to hear, you know, discussion that acknowledges this and how important it is. Um, and that if, if it's sort of disavowed or, you know, I think that says a lot about the artist's position and experience. Um, so anyway, my question, or maybe it's a, sort of a, a prompt um, that maybe you could riff on both of you, um, mm -hmm. is the issue of, and the concept of assimilation uh, versus appropriation in cultural product, um, particularly in painting, I guess. But um, like, how do these dimensions, how, how, how do these dynamics interact or counteract each other or what? 
I mean, um, I think it's really a matter of how, how you how you look at your, your 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 transactions. I mean, how you're looking at assimilation and what that what that process is for you versus appropriation. I mean, one is to you know uh, to in a certain sense internalize, and one is just to like you know a kind of objectification and, and, and taking um, in an objectified sort of manner. I mean, it's, it's to what end are you are you engaging the the actions, and to what end do you want? To what end are you are you are you have you, to what hand have you gone in the process? I mean, what what is produced, and how is it produced one way versus another? So I think the question kind of goes back to to you, and in a sense of like, uh, what what are you what are you doing, and how and how does it uh, form? And you have to reflect on that in a way in which. I can't because I, I, I don't know, these are not negative processes and negative pathways. It's a matter of just what outcomes, um, what outcomes are, are, are exist for you and, and how, and how do you, how do you see it for yourself? Does that, does that, does that, um, um, yeah, no, I was just wondering, uh, I mean, it, it wasn't so much a question, uh, for myself, I guess I was thinking about it in terms of, the labeling of works as assimilative or appropriative or, you know, the kinds of judgments that are passed with those terms. Right. right. Um, and, you know, just how they reflect in various interpretations or, and, and how one well, deal, how as an artist one deals with those, you know, nuances and complications. I think it's a, that's, that's very much clear. And I think it's a really a matter of, of, of result. I mean, I think again, it's sort of like, when you're when you're engage, when you're doing when you're engaging either process is a matter of uh, how how clear are you with your source information how clear are you with your 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 source I mean and how how much do you acknowledge it how much do you acknowledge where you're coming from and uh, what you're discussing what you're bringing into the table and um, are we going to perform these processes in a way that in which they were done before with like a, a master narrative of erasure and uh and uh uh formation and erasure or are we going to do something else and something different so i think it's a matter of just uh being attuned to uh the history of these processes and to understand that when you engage this these things i mean um what is the what is what is the outcome and what is your awareness of the history of the process because you're talking about something that's related to like say are you going to are you going to do blackface? You know, what about uh, drag? What about drag performance? Is it sexist for queer men to to do drag? That's a really interesting question, I think. So we we have to be able to 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 really um, understand the history of these of these processes and be able to know uh, what the outcome is. So it's not to say that you can't. Uh, as a Caucasian person can't get your hair braided in African style, or you can't wear uh, uh, an African dashiki, but to understand that there is some kind of, uh, some people can see it as problematic because of the history of, of past use and past discourse. Odili, you know, maybe you could talk about, um, relative to this, when you were talking about whitescapes in that PBS special, you were talking mm -hmm. about, um, consensus like that mm -hmm. we have to kind of agree upon something right for it to be um that's very albers albersian as well which i love <laughs> but but this idea of consensus you know, sometimes it gets you know it gets short shrift or it's it's not you know it's not purposeful enough or it seems kind of kind of middle middling or something like that sometimes you know well it, it's 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 important in in this day and age I think of what you said makes me think of the issue of masks, wearing masks in public. And there's some people who don't want to wear them. And there's some people who say that they have a, a God given right to not wear those things. But you have to look at what that is. That's so interesting when you really think about what's being said here. You know, on one hand, it's truly about, are you really going to not consider somebody else? Because that's what wearing a mask is. Essentially, it's not about protecting my own, right. my own self. I'm trying to make sure my spit doesn't get onto somebody else. 
everybody watch Michael Rappaport's video on wearing a mask because <laughs> it's damn funny. But the thing is, there is the idea of what, what goes behind this idea that I'm not going to wear a mask and I don't care about this idea of protecting somebody else. And what does that mean? And how does that come into you being a part of this so-called nation of, of citizenry and peoples? And then the idea of not wearing the mask and thinking about in the sense of there is this idea of individuation that is very much a part of the history of this place as well that also is a strong, there's a strong fundamental value in that kind of notion of being indiv individuating yourself and looking at that as well. So it's sort of like, for me, it's, 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 it's important to be able to recognize that when we're talking about a society, that those people who might, I, who I personally might think are stupid, have a perspective and a point of view that is historically grounded. Right. And then we have to actually question that historical grounding and say, what are we progressing with? Is this part of what white supremacy is? And I think that it is in a certain context when we talk about how can you say, oh, I'm going to not wear a mask. It's my God-given right. But that person who's running from the police because they're afraid should just stop and be zapped by those tasers. Right. I'm going to shoot somebody because they told me not to wear a flag, to wear a mask, but that guy should stop and be tasered. Right. I think maybe the arc of history is not dynamically sold if it, if it, if it goes towards consensus. You know, it's like, I think we like difference for, for better or worse. We like for a song, you know. We're, we're a culture of different people and the world is made up of different things and the understanding of that difference that is in Albers where he saw, talks about interactivity and what happens with the third new thing. That's interactivity. It's not the blending of just two things into this kind of bland set third thing. The, 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 the interaction is something new gets made. And that's what happens when you have the genius of difference being able to be applied to what we do in the world. Right, and the curvature of space in like, say like a value scale is endless. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think that's a, a good transition to uh, actually our next question, which comes from Andrew. Andrew, I'm going to activate your mic. Can you hear Hi, me? Hi, Odile, and great conversation. Uh, Hi. Um, I'm, I'm curious about the the dynamic between public space and and um, and sort of so to speak private space in the relationship of of using um, sort of cultural triggers in the use of color um, and 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 as a differential from like the like the perceptual uh, context of your quoting uh, Blinky Palermo. As, as so that in a sense that sort of because in public space there's more of an anonymous uh, uh, set of terms and I'm just curious about how you're feeling about that or, or what you're learning about that kind of dynamic of and how color works in uh, um, as as a as a as a, uh, a perceptual motivator but not necessarily um, in the Blinky Tim Palermo uh, model. I mean, for, uh, for myself, I, I just want to underscore, underscore, like when I've been at lectures and, you know, like this or talks and the artist is talking, I mean, I, I have no in means to speak of the way in which I'm trying to say what I'm saying is right and everybody else is wrong or I'm going to teach somebody something. I'm just wanting to speak in from my position as, an, as a single individual artist to, to everybody here and answer questions that way. So, when I'm looking at color in, in that sense in the, pu in the public spa space, there is a certain power it has when we think we can think about the idea of how color is used uh, in, in, in minimal and conceptual ways in, in, in social culture. Uh, and then a certain kind of uh, notion of chromophobia uh, that exists, exists with color in, in, in social settings and social spaces and in the ways in which color can utilizing that 
that notion of color, that understanding of color in a, in a more like perceptual, psychological perceptual way, it's to say that you can, you can, there are many ways in which you can use it as a form of, 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 I don't want to say attack in as much as like protest in the sense of wanting to be able to engineer a certain kind of feeling or mood. And this is how I'm using it. This is how I'm trying to use it. Not a declarative in the sense of this means this, or this is this politic or whatnot, but in a way to create a certain kind of notion of calm or hysteria or a certain kind of discombobulation that disturbs the nature of structure within a space. Because I'm not trying to have the work assimilate when I'm working in the, in the public space. I want it to highlight. I want it to counter. And I want it to become a part of at the same instance. So it's to be able to have this kind of balance of being able to, that the thing is self-aware in as much as it's uh, self-proclaiming, mm -hmm. you know. In that sense, I'm understanding how I'm trying to use color. It's very interesting to see how other people might use color. There's so many limitless ways of, of engaging color. And uh, I'm, that's why I'm always so interested in how people use it, yeah, personally. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Adili. Uh, our next question comes from Bahar. Bahar, I'm going to activate your mic now. Can you hear us? Okay. I think we're having some mic issues with Bahar. So um, if, let me just move on to the next question. So um, I have a question from our own, on our staff, Miko, uh, Miko, I think you can activate your own mic. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, hi, hi Miko. Hi, thanks so much. Um, yeah, um, you referenced comics a few times and right. I was, um, yeah, I was really curious about that and was wondering if you could talk about some of the comics you read as a kid or maybe read yeah. now. Um, they seem to have an influence on you. Um, I was also thinking about what you and your father said about the importance of drawing above everything else. And um, yeah, made me think of comics, so. Mm -hmm. I mean, with, for my dad, I think with drawing, it was almost like a, ta like a skill kind of task exercise, almost like calisthenics in a certain way, in which he engaged it, but a way of understanding the different ways you can reform a space. So at a certain early part for me, just thinking about the idea of the canvas space and drawing, it was almost like, how many ways can I divide the space? But if you're thinking of it, space is one way, you're gonna have you reach your limit. But if you start to think of all the different ways in which you can understand the term space, and then even multiply, sandwich or multiply that within the idea of thinking about space, then you're gonna have even a greater ways and more ways in which you might be surprised exist in the sense of using drawing to define space. And say with comics, what's in interesting about comics, I'm looking at them and I'm realizing my color comes from comics in a certain way in the sense of, oh, it's like four color. I'm thinking four color, like printmakers will think of understand four color uh, technology or people who are using mass production to print things will understand the CMYK thing. And so in a way, I, I looked at color like this. I didn't think of color like out of a TV set in as much as I understood that the color is coming from a TV set. But when I was thinking of the comics, I was thinking about it, that color in a different way, like on that paper and the way in which that color had that flatness on that paper. So that's another, that's another notion of space in the way in which we engage technology or technological terms or processes to understand a, a type of space you know, photographic, um, uh, cinematic, uh, the computer light in the space from that. And so like for me uh, with comic books as well, it was the idea of the kind of replication it had with cinema or with this idea of the big picture. You know, there's always, I read a lot of superhero comics when I was a kid and later on uh, in, when I was in school, uh, uh, college and graduate school, I would read, you know, uh, underground comics and, and this kind of thing and there were certain comics I liked but I was more interested in the stories and now you know I like when I went left graduate school 
sold my comic book collection to help pay for rent in New York City. And then when I got a job at uh, some of you guys from uh, at Tyler School of Art know that a, a slew of comic books are coming into the mailroom because I had a job I was paying <laughs> to, to get these comic books back that I sold off. But um, the thing is that uh, um, I don't read them anymore. I just look at the pictures. I'm not really that interested in them anymore. And something like I follow them as a digest or some kind of novella digest, like I would watch a TV show to get that kind of experience from. For me, it's the quality of the drawing. I, I love comic books just to look at the art and to look at that drawing and to see the dynamics of space and tension and, and, um, and value and, and just line work, you know, just line work. And, and I appreciate it, the form, because it's related, it relates to cinema, it relates to storyboarding. It's something that is not just a kind of a, a, um, a, 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 a degraded type of art form. But in fact, looking at the history of comics and comic artists, it is, has a kind of a tragic experiential thing because in the end of the day, it lives off of its own replication. And it's very hard to find people who transformed the craft of comic books and when you have those few that do they're like it's like incredible so it's like any terrain if you put your imagination to it you can really just do anything and maybe sometimes it's the audience that limits the experience of what artists can create or rather it's the job of the artist to maybe lead the audience to new conditions of seeing and thinking about this form i don't know if i answered your question it kind of went off a little bit on the no, yeah, that was great. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Odili. Um, so Bahar, uh, apologies, uh, the mic is not working, but I am gonna read Bahar's question on her behalf. Um, Bahar asks, well, firstly says thank you, but asks, um, I'm wondering to know your feeling toward the medium of painting in our society today, given the urgency of such movements like Black Lives Matter. If you felt painting wasn't responding urgently to the issues in the 90s for you, that is something that Bahar is pondering these days in her own studio. Um, so how do you feel this relates to painting these days? Um, I think revisiting that political urgency maybe that you felt. I think it's important to reflect on that, definitely. Um, that was a question I had in 2016. Uh, after the presidential election, why, why, what am I gonna do with, as a painter um, after this day? And it helped me, that shock helped me to stop painting for a while, to rethink my content and to rethink my purpose. And it wasn't about necessarily just rethinking form and formation, but about in the fact of thinking about process and content, it helped to change form for me in the way in which I was approaching the work conceptually actively as a person and what the work could do within space and within places. So I think it's, a, it's not a, a bad question to be put into this place of question to the point of like not wanting to do anything for a, a while. Um, I think we're in that sort of situation again with uh, this pandemic. And this pandemic as awful as it, as, as it has been, um, there have been very profound things that have come out of it in the sense of looking at uh, um, uh, ecology in as much as uh, science, in as much as health, and um, and the idea of uh, uh, health and uh, the community at large, and how we interact. I mean, I look at my life and think, my God, I was I was in a rat race, and the month before everything closed down, I was literally booked to fly to four different cities, and I don't want to get on a plane for the next five years right now. And so for me, it's like uh, I, I I'm wondering what this all is about when we somebody's telling me and i've said this before in another podcast when we have 25 percent decline in, in world pollution and what that what what is what's that and could the world ever stop for the world could the world ever stop for the ecology and say oh we're going to actually like stop for three months so we can clean the earth like hell no but we have this happening now and that's new possibility that's like oh i discovered something in a painting because i did this thing here i didn't know that this could happen and that's the correlation between being a painter and being an activist knowing that the politic of an artist is being an artist your oneself 
that's where you can create your change by doing what you're doing, not by what you make or what it is looks like, but by doing what you're doing. That's political action. And that's the point of making and creating change in the world. That's uh, such a beautiful response, Odili. Thank you. Um, I would love to thank everyone. I feel like this conversation honestly could go on for probably another hour or two, but um, I want to thank everyone that submitted questions, but um, we have nearly run out of time. And um, for our final question, I would like to turn the mic over to our very own Fong Bowie. Fong. Hi, Fong. Hey, good day. Hi. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I created panic with your your texts and, and call, phone calls. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's uh, I'm very technologically Neanderthal, very okay. super slow. But <sighs> I just finally learned how to do it, so that's you know, it's new for me. But thank you for the exciting conversation. And um, I, you know, when early on when you and Tom was talking about. Um, the diagonal, it just reminded me when Theodor Van Sterberg introduced the diagonal <laughs> into, uh, you know, neoplasticism. Mondrian wrote the famous letter saying similar, ever since you introduced the diagonal, our collaboration is no longer possible. Mm. And, but it, it also reminded me of how cubism generate also neoplasticism as it did with constructivism. So the, the two terms that come on my mind right away is signif significant form. We don't know whether Clyde Bell did it or Roger Fell, Roger Fry claim it, but and then dynamic equilibrium is the one that we associate with this deal, with, with neoclassicism. But in your work, you know, there's a, there's a sonic sensibility, but I would, you know, like to even refer it as a spectral equanimity, you know? Yeah, I mean, you, you touch upon, I'm looking up this term, okay. Um, because you, you talked about Theo van Doesburg and, and, uh, and uh, Mondrian, and I'm trying to place them in relation to suprematism and, and constructivism where particularly in suprematism you do have diagonals and then it's sort of like we we talk about you can talk about the I look at personally I'm interested in the study and relationship between Bauhaus and suprematism or Bauhaus and constructivism where Bauhaus is about a simulation and uh, suprematism constructivism as I see it was is about critique and so that to me is like an interesting way in which I'm looking at how drawing and formations uh, become a certain, there's a contest between what is something to establish the end of a painting, the end mm -hmm. of consideration of it, and then something that's established as, establishes itself as critique and change. Yeah. What, what, yeah, I love to follow up one thing. It, it might sound a little bit general, but perhaps not. I remember having the privilege in meeting Bo Diddley in the Live Aid concert after a party. And I remember asking him, where did you get your name from, sir? And he'd say, from the Diddley Ball. And I knew the Diddley Ball, so that was an incredible revelation. But then he tested me on it. And because I brought in Delta Blues, and he'd say, what is Muddy Waters' real name? And I say, McKinley Morganfield. He say, good. And then we start talking about um, how the blues got from, you know, West Africa, from different places in Africa, to Delta blues. The reason I'm asking this simply because during the Great Migration, you know, particularly from in the 60s, the 70s, I think 1970s when it ends really, uh, a lot of, uh, African American went to North, obviously, and so a lot of Delta Blues people, including Muddy Waters and Big Bill Brunzi and others, came to uh, Chicago. And because of the chess record, dissemination of record was able to send off to different places. You know what I mean? Particularly in Africa, certainly in Nigeria, they could visit 
a lot of Nigerian great bluesmen that I had been listening to, Yami Alade, Tigua Savage, Abiwan. And my point is that, is there any, because your color, your set of color is very unusual. It's not quite exactly what it seemed to be, even though it's very flatly painted and whatnot. The rhythm is very particular. Very so, particular. I mean, for me, me. So I'm just asking whether any, you know, that roots for where you came from certainly play a, a, a part in it. Because I'm trying to figure out whether any Vietnamese left in me, you know, <laughs> that, that resonate in what I do. Sometimes we ask those questions, you know, really. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's like using, trying to see how one form has affected your knowledge in another form. Yes. And that's like, kind of almost like an osmosis thing in the end of the day. I think that it's, for me, music is so incredibly important and rhythms are so important. And the way in which my color moves in my painting is based totally entirely on sequencing and rhythm, creating rhythms. I love, uh, and I, I learned from music while, while I was painting in my studio over the years, particularly it was a point of time when I was listening to uh, uh, New York music, you know, no, 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 no music. You know, mm. no, uh, I was listening to a lot of uh, underground uh, New York sound, uh, under, uh, Velvet Underground and things of this nature. I listened to a lot of classical minimalist music, particularly Philip Glass at a certain point. And, you know, from Philip Glass to like um, um, Joy Division, you know, listening to ways in which people, musicians and artists would sing and make and, and, and engage pulsations and sounds, how they would open and close them, how they would end, begin and end music and have the space in the middle. And I look back and I think, wow, I mean, I went to Bennington College and I, I see uh, Susanna Jolson and uh, Bennington, you know, Bennington alum, but when I was there, we, I, 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 I was, um, I worked with a guy named Bill Dixon uh, at the time and um, didn't know who he was or whatever, but he was this cool guy with his glass sunglasses. And, uh, but he would play music for us and just say, you know, we had to just learn by, we can listen to jazz by doing something else while we listen to it. Not something complicated, but something relaxing so we can actually absorb this music and understand this music through just listening. And over the years, I, I feel like I'm very close to jazz in the sense of uh, have a very deep understanding of it. And when I've heard people talk about musicians from the South living in the North talk about like, this sound is like the chickens that they would see in the field, or this is the, 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 the beat of the, of the street or the rhythm of the street, it's mm -hmm. to say that they're putting images to this abstraction. And that was so profound for me to say that, wow, this, this sound, that seems to not refer to anything can be located in things that I understand. And then to be able to learn from Bill the way in which you can relax and do normal things as you're listening to this music and see it become a part of the function of your day in a way you can understand what it is as you're doing things in your day. And so like for me, music has got that kind of, there's rhythm in everything. So when I listen to uh, Metal Machine Music by Lou Reed, I think that that's extremely classical in a classical sense, yeah. the way it's structured. It's absolutely so structured. Yeah. And to say that something I used to listen, I listened to at one point when I first heard it, I thought it was just noise, like noise. But no, in a way, there's no such thing as noise. I mean, yeah. you, 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 and I, I, I'm, I get very abstract with music because I love it so much. I feel like I'm a failed musician that's become a painter. So it's like, okay, I'm looking at music and the way in which it scores itself. And right. then to think of how drawing and art and painting can score itself in the way that thinking mm -hmm. is a score of itself, like language and speaking is a score where you're putting information to group, together and grouping it to make a sequence Right. That sequence is, it's, it's, it's the way the brain thinks itself. It's the way the computer thinks. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you so much, Odili and Tom okay. and Fong. And I'm so happy that we could kind of end on a sort of musical note. Um, right. <laughs> That said, uh, we have a tradition at the rail of ending all of our conversations with a poem. 
uh, and with a small poetry reading. Today, we're really, really pleased and happy to have Mary Riley with us. A quick intro for Mary. Um, Mary's poems and translations have appeared in the New York Quarterly Bowery Women Soulages Century, and most recently, the Radapalax and Bowery Arts and Science Collaborative Guzzle Poetry is Like Bread. She is also the recipient of two Beeson Fellowships and a Leclerc for her research on contemporary French poetry. Uh, Mary is the a poetry curator at Levy Gorvi and has been since 2018. So please check out their social media and see some of the great programming she does over there. And with that, I am going to turn it over to you, Mary. Thank you, Nick. And thank you, Rodelia and Tom. This has been such a beautiful and, uh, and, and complex. Um, I was just thinking what a wonderful communicator you are of, of, of really nuanced and difficult ideas, Odili. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to read uh, just two, two short poems. The first uh, is called Ode to Sylvia, who is actually uh, one of my closest friends, a poet, philosopher um, Sylvia Gorelick and she's in this um, she's in this zoom call she's my um, my mascot or something I suppose um, so Ode to Sylvia ravishing life you unbridled still ride as child of your own unquiet quietude speak Sylvia shining kill us free of this undead our own undying lassitude lash us spitting, your tongue, Ogier's knife. But no, we need you living. Daunt us, never dim your light. Ideas of souls who burn too bright are lies. Genius, virtue, over sensitivity, and other myths of capitalists do not require tragedy. As though anything eternal could be better than you in this moment when we are free as we allow ourselves and the love between us is redemption enough for now. And who's too good to live long? And loads of oafs die young. No hallowed field. Besides, the world is full enough of pain, wonder, and complexity to occupy us all indefinitely. You spoke of Point de Nord, of Pascal Ogier, the dragons she fought were real. She is dead, you live, art not enough to sustain either of you. Uh, the next poem is called Garden at Night. I'm gonna hold it up to the screen so you can see the second stanzas crossed out. Uh, and this actually appeared um, in an anthology of poems that Sylvia edited for, um, for the Levy Gorvey Gallery when she was its uh, poetry curator. And the only thing um, worth mentioning, I believe, is that the he in the third stanza is, um, is the God of Abraham. And, and more specifically, um, that God, uh, as if the, you know, as if the, new, the, the events of the New Testament were were historical events, I suppose. Uh, so, so the God of the New Testament in essence, or, or the, the God that um, exists under that context. I don't know if that's particularly clear. I get very nervous when I read and find it difficult to speak. So, garden at night, the lake, all lightly laughing halts. The last geese, who should never in winter have stopped here anyway, flap away in V's. Bad omens, the people ignore, too busy on their phones. And yet, they do come down to skate. So proving, once for all, we still own skates, like weather, flush in cold air. At the edge, they josh, sighing, all of them secretly. It's come again, see, winter, winter when they said it wouldn't. And after winter, certainly spring. Sky from water land, our earth wild again, vines, fruit, failure, little coats made of skin, protect us. Weeping God, final exit, to desert wind, barren rock, behemoths, swarms, hard labor, ourselves. 
Had we remembered it would all end, what might we have said instead? The sun shines for you, he said when the sun was shining. To utter such nonsense in daylight, what a fool. Forbidding one thing, he promised another. Knowing full well we would fail, he gave us everything, twice. Nighttime now, all he left us now ash. A shock of corn cometh in in a drought, hacked apart for kindling. Alive again, what might he say out of the whirlwind? Something useless, surely. Thanks. Wow. Thank you, Mary, so much. Um, there is a vast grid of people clapping and, and snapping right now. Um, and thank you that your reading was very beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. Again, uh, before I end it, I just want to, Odili and Tom, thank you so much. And I don't know if there's anything you wanted to say at the end here or <clears throat> before I bid adieu to everyone. I just want to say thanks. <laughs> yeah, the same. And the reading was powerful. Thank yeah, you so beautiful much. Beautiful poem. Yeah. Oh. So I, I want to thank everyone again for the, the questions that uh, we weren't able to get to, but you know, thank you for being so uh, engaged in the chat. Uh, we do this every day at 1 p.m. Uh, please stay, uh, sorry, please tune in on Monday. We have the members of Deniston Hill, which is a group, an, a collective of the artists, Julie Meritu, Lawrence Chua, and Paul Pfeiffer. Uh, so we'll be there at 1 p.m. I want to wish everyone a happy Independence Day, however you choose to celebrate that. And uh, certainly, I'm um, fa fairly grateful for all of you for being here, especially you, Odili, Tom, and Mary. So thank you again, mm -hmm. and have a wonderful weekend. And I believe at this point, everyone is able to unmute their, or activate their microphones if you would like to say hello. Hello. Thank you, Odili. Hey. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Hey, thank Candida. You. Thank you. Hi, Candida. Thanks. Hi. Thanks. Such a Thanks wonderful day. Felicia. Hi, Odile. I'll ask my question later. Great conversation. Hi. Thank you, JC, also. Thank you guys so much. Thanks, Thank Andrew. Thank you.